walk the winter's beach Have so little to remember The year is growing old Already it's December So, Julie, thanks for joining us on Billboard today. You first came to England in the 60s, yes. 1964? Yeah, I think I actually came in 63, and my first mm. album was released mm. in 64. Okay. But before that, you'd been touring Europe? Um, well, I just... Um, I was kind of a, you know, just a, a, a beatnik. I was just wandering around. I wasn't actually uh, counting on being a professional singer. I just sort of yeah. uh, ran out of money. And so I started singing in bars and restaurants and, and sort of made my way around. Okay. And then uh, yeah. and I came to, to visit a friend in, in, in London. Okay. Uh, and then um, some, some Scottish folk singers that I met uh, in Germany uh, took me along to a folk club and I sang some songs and there was a guy called Bruce Dunnett and he made a tape and he took it to uh, David Platt's at Essex Music and David took it to Hugh Mendel at Decca Records and um, and they just sort of talked to me and it was it was when Baez and, and Dylan were kind of you know coming to the fore and uh, and they and I was the first um, uh, Folk singer to sign to sign with a with a major label, so yeah. so that sort of like opened up the uh, the future. The whole world of folk for people, yeah, mm. yeah. I'm not lonely. I'm not lonely. I'm not lonely. I think one of your early influences, not so much for your music, but your lifestyle, was um, some of the beat poets like Jack Kerouac. Yeah, I mean, that was why I, I kind of wanted to travel. It was definitely uh, Jack Kerouac on the road that, that influenced me to just go and taste life, you know, because growing up in Southern California, I was kind of isolated. I, I'd been to Mexico to see my, my family, my grandparents, but uh, I'd never been to anywhere else. So it was, I just wanted to to go to Europe and see the rest of the world. <laughs> now, I understand your father was a big early influence on your, your music. Yes, well, my father was born and raised in Mexico, in Sonora, mm -hmm. and he came to the States in his late teens. Um, and he, he became a, a mariachi musician, and mm -hmm. he could play uh, the guitar, the accordion, and the piano. Um, but he always played music, and, and he taught me... Uh, well, my mother gave me a ukulele once, <gasps> and I started the ukulele, and I couldn't play it, so my dad taught me play that. And then when I was in high school, I was 17, and somebody wanted me to accompany them on the guitar. And so I asked my dad to show me the other two strings, you know, <laughs> and I, uh, and I, and so he taught me, and then I, I started playing, and I, I play at parties and fun, you know, people would, would say, come to my party and bring your guitar. <laughs> so, uh, so I became uh, quite, a, uh, quite popular with the, with the, with the, with the, with the parties when I was at university. <laughs> And of course, those sort of influences were there in, in you know, your most well-known uh, record and hit in, in If I Could, mm -hmm. um, which, um, uh, which I think everyone remembers you for. Yeah, that was the first remember. record I made with Mickey Most. It yeah, was really, yeah, at DKA. Yeah, 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 it, was, yeah. Uh, it was really, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it was great working with him. He, hmm. I really, before that, I was just, Put in a little box and told mm. to sing, you know, mm. and then yeah. and then they, mm. they, 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 all the musicians. And Mickey brought me into the uh, into the mixing room and mm. and listened to different tracks and 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 it was before all the digital stuff, so you had to mm. to do a mix, you know, mm. like right. And, mm. and I was like mixing it, and it was so exciting. I'd rather be a hammer than a nail. Yes, I would. If I only could, I surely would. On your travels, you also uh, met someone who I think became a lifelong friend, and that's Leonard Cohen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, apparently um, there's just a film that's come out about Marianne and, and mm -hmm. Leonard. And uh, I know they, they came and interviewed me once, but I didn't know if it was part of the thing or not. But my friends wrote me and said that, yeah, they, that oh, I am okay. part. So I'm really touched <laughs> because... 
Marianne was a, a dear mm. friend of mine as mm. well, yeah. and the, to lose them both in the same year was really devastating. Yeah. Uh, but yes, when, when I left America, when I told you mm. that I left mm. America, I went um, across to New York with my friend, mm -hmm. and we took a boat to Patras in Greece, mm -hmm. and um, her brother was living, living uh, on the island of Idra with his partner, mm. so they met us there, and then we took a little kaiki over to, to mm. Idra, and, uh, and there were... Um, there were several writers and painters. They were all very creative people. Mm. It wasn't mm. your sort of. It was before package days yeah. and all that. Mm. Uh, and I met this young poet uh, mm. called Leonard Cohen, and he used to borrow my Mexican guitar that my dad gave me uh, when I left. And he would sing Union songs. Uh -huh. So he he wasn't writing his own songs, and mm. and I I wasn't either. I mean, mm. I, we just sort of sang some songs together, mm. and yes. and. Uh, and then when he, uh, I met him a couple of times on the continent, and then when he became a, a, a musician and a, a songwriter, he sent me his album. And that's just when, I had done the Frost Report, and that's just when I started my own series. Mm. And uh, so I talked to Stanley Dorfman, and he said, yeah, let's put him on the show. So, mm. th so that was the first time he'd ever been uh, on, on television in Europe. Now it's come to distances, and both of us must try. Soft with sorrow. Hey, that's no way to say goodbye. My series was the first in color, mm -hmm. and uh, and, and anywhere uh, it was on the BBC, and they needed the the tape because it was very expensive in those days. So. All of the shows are wiped. It's just such a tragedy. I had, you know, people like Tim Buckley, Dusty yeah. Springfield, and, mm. and uh, Richard Harris, and, and Spike Milligan. All the songs they sing, they wrote themselves. They're Robin and Mike, the incredible string band. Also, before your, your own show, you were part of probably the most avant-garde piece of television at the time with David Frost. Yeah, yeah. And this sort of juxtaposition between the traditional folk and this sort of avant-garde um, uh, TV show, you know, it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. well, it was because up to then they had used mm. uh, jazz singers, uh, mm. what's mm. Millicent Martin, mm. um, and uh, when they were doing the, the, the pilot mm. uh, for, for the Frost Report, they, um, uh, they used a jazz singer and me, but mm. then they decided to go with the folk Thing, mm. you know, so, mm. And they mm. said that each, um, each program would be a different uh, subject, you know, mm. and they said, like, we're going to have one on education. Do you know any songs on education? And, uh, and I thought uh, of Tom Paxton, what did you learn in school today? Ah, yeah. So I, yeah. luckily I was <laughs> got in there at the right time. Zoo, zoo, how about you, 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 you can come too, 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 we're going to the zoo, zoo, zoo. Mama's taking us to the zoo tomorrow, zoo tomorrow, zoo tomorrow. Mama's so, uh, taking us to yeah, the zoo. Yeah, I had, it, it was a live show, you know, mm, and, and yeah. I had mm. no idea because I hadn't really done very much television at all before that. Mm. And, uh, you know, to, to, I never realized that when we were actually in the studio that millions of people were watching, watching yeah. you know, so <laughs> it was quite, uh, yeah, quite yeah, mind blowing. Yeah. And after your success during the 60s and 70s and early 80s, with an album every year and, and various singles, you stopped. Yeah, I got a bit uh, fed up with the sort of commercial side of everything. Mm. And, mm. and so I stopped singing and I, uh, mm. I went back to California for a while. Mm. And, uh, and I got involved with yoga and uh, meditation, mm. those things of sort of soul searching, you know. Mm. Mm. And then... Uh, and then I went on a, I lived in Norway for a year before mm -hmm. that, and um, uh, they were organizing a peace march in Central America, mm -hmm. because that was a time when um, the, the Sandinistas were legally elected government, and Ronald Reagan was trying to bring them down because they were a socialist government. They're still doing the same thing today. <laughs> Never done nothing. So, uh, so when I got back from that march, I decided I, there was still a lot to sing about. So I came back to England and started singing. <laughs> but you started singing about 
things that were important to you rather than just commercial songs. Then. Well, yeah, yeah, but I think I always sort of did, <clears throat> but in a more, not in such a personal experience of mm. it. You know, yeah. like I sang Masters of War mm. in 1964, mm. um, because, I, you know, I, that was Vietnam and everything. I mean, mm. we were all against the war, mm. but the personal contact uh, that, I, that I experienced in, in Central America was, uh, uh, was very influential. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And you also sort of um, behind your music, you also discovered a, a more spiritual side to to life. I was I went to Glastonbury and I mm -hmm. went into a um, a bookshop there called the Gothic Image, and the owner Jamie George, lovely lovely man, uh, said that he took tours of uh, magical Britain, and it was basically around the um, Arthurian legends. And would I come and be the resident troubadour? And I thought that sounded really wow. fun because they went to <laughs> yeah. Scotland, they went to, to, to Cornwall and places mm. that I hadn't been. I learned about earth mysteries and, and the power of, of the land. And, and then I really got to, to, to find out that there was a whole history of, of matriarchal uh, influences that were that we that had been erased, you know, we said God the Father, God they said somebody said, uh, they decided God was a man, then all men decided they were God. <laughs> uh, and then I found out from the goddess movement that, that, the, the, that the female deity was, was worshipped, you know, all, especially in, in Wales and, and, and Ireland. And... There's a woman who lives in the desert. There's a woman who dwells in the night. You can hear her moving in the shadows. See your shadow in the pale moonlight. So how do you view the world now compared with the world as it was in the 60s when we grew up? Well, there was a lot more optimism in the 60s. In the 60s, we were concerned we wanted to change the world. Mm. Now I just go, oh my God, you know, mm. what's mm. going to happen? Mm. And uh, I mean, I'm still singing and still uh, praying and uh, still doing my rituals to try to mm. bring good energy into the world. So I don't think anyone can get their head around the idea that you recently celebrated your 80th birthday. Well, I, yeah, well, I recently <laughs> celebrated my 81st birthday. Yeah, but, 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 but you had a big celebration. Yeah, a great big celebration. Yeah, yeah that was really yeah. great. What did you do? Well, I had a concert uh, in London, and uh, my friend John Paul Jones, he's, um, um, he was a bass player with Led Zeppelin, and uh, he's a good, really dear friend. I've known him for years. And he came and played mandolin on, on four or five songs with me. It was just beautiful. And then at the end, we all got together, and, and John playing and, and Madeline, and we, we sang Forever Young together. And it was just <laughs> magic. It was just, you know, we, we really had so much fun, and, and the audience did too. So that was, mm -hmm. so now I'm heading for my 90th. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you're 82 now. No, 81. 81, sorry. Don't make me worse. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that bit out. That, that's just 38, <clears throat> yeah, I was for. Yeah. So you're 81 now. Uh, you, last night you were gigging. Yeah, and today, the night before I was yeah, gigging. Yeah. Today you're in a recording studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what keeps you going? Uh, I, well, I, I think a lot of it is the music. I th I, you know, people hmm. ask me about that. and um, I, I really come to appreciate it much more than I did when I was younger. Uh, and I think that anybody that is involved creatively, uh, they, they kind of have a source to the creator. Uh, and so whether you're in music or painting or doing the gardening, something that, 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 that really takes your, your, all your being to get involved with it, I think that that keeps you young. Mm. So I, I invite everybody to go out and be creative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... Julie, you're a great inspiration to people of my generation that grew up with you when you were in the 60s and a great inspiration to the new generation of young people and folks in this. Thanks for joining us on Billboard. Thank you. I'd rather be a forest than a street. Yes, I would. If I could, I surely would. 
I'd rather feel the earth beneath my feet Yes, I would If I only could I surely would 